Welcome to Kingdom Theology. I hope you're blessed in the Lord today. In this video, I want to talk about historic Christianity, also known as orthodoxy or the standard that we, the Christian faith was established on. Uh, when I mention orthodoxy, I've mentioned it in quite a few of my videos because it's very helpful as we study theology to understand what orthodoxy is. But as I mention it, a lot of times people will maybe think that I'm talking about Eastern Orthodoxy, the religion. You know, there's, there's Roman Catholicism in the West and Eastern Orthodoxy in the East. I'm not talking anything about that. I believe that that is way off uh, heretical and uh, idolatrous in many ways. And so it doesn't have anything to do with that. It has basically to do with the teaching of the early church, particularly the first few hundred years of the church, the consensus that they had, the beliefs that they had. And so I want to talk today about how it's useful for us to understand orthodoxy and to be guided by orthodoxy. Now, I don't mean that orthodoxy and the teaching of the early church is equal to scripture by, by no means, and I'll give some examples of, of how early church was off in some areas. But it is helpful to us to be able to have the understanding of what the early Christians believed about Christianity, what they had received from the apostles, and what they continue to walk in, and whether they were in North Africa, or they, they were in Europe, or they were in the Middle East, that they had a consensus on certain matters. And understanding that consensus can help us as we work through different theologies, because we're 2,000 years later after Christ, and there's been a lot of different ideas, a lot of different concepts, philosophies, theologies that have come up, and it's kind of like we're kind of left to kind of either choose one tradition and just follow it, you know, either just become Calvinist or we become Lutheran, you know, or we become Baptist with its kind of mix or whatever we become, and then we just got to fall in line with that. But if we want to really wrestle with the scriptures and wrestle with what the teaching of the scripture is, then we're going to have to face a lot of different theological issues. And in doing that, sometimes we can imagine that it's just us, our mind, the context of scripture, and just praying and hoping that we get it right. But there's more to that. Uh, I found in my own life that going back and appealing to orthodoxy can help me kind of limit the scope of what I need to even consider. Because there's some things out there that just don't really need to be considered. They're not actually valid options on the theological market. And so I want to talk through this, and I want to go kind of in depth to this, and and, and and help us to understand how to use orthodoxy. I want to talk about what it is, what the uh, benefits of it are. I want to talk about what the limitations of it are and what the dangers of it are, because there are certain dangers that when people jump into the readings of the early church, there's certain dangers that I have seen people go into and that I was tempted to, in my, to go into myself. And so we need to think clearly about these issues. And so I just want to share practically on these matters. So, the first thing, let's go ahead and look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Actually, before that, let me uh, let me share my kind of my testimony on this issue. Uh, you know, if you found this channel, maybe the reason you found this channel is because of my my teaching on Calvinism, my going through those issues. I have a long playlist on Calvinism, like 70, 80 videos. And so when you go through that, maybe that's why you came here. Well, Originally, the reason I discovered orthodoxy was because of Calvinism. It was probably, it was around 2011, maybe 2011, 2012, something like that, where I was writing a book against Calvinism. At that time, I was an open theist. Now, an open theist is somebody that believes that God knows the, the future as much as it can be known. Uh, in other words, he doesn't know the every choice that a free will creature is going to make because it's a free will choice and they're the ones that make it. And so until they make it, it doesn't exist. So I was in that kind of mindset. It, well, I wasn't like deep into it or anything like that, but that was my mindset. I was, I was coming from an open theist perspective. Uh, but on other issues, I was mainly just Arminian. I was Arminian in my views. And so as I was writing this book, you know, there's certain things that I could go, and the scripture is very clear what Romans 9 means. It doesn't mean determinism. I could go through it, but there was at the time that I came to the chapter, and the chapter that I had to write was on God's foreknowledge. How does God know the future? You know, because if you're talking about Arminianism or open theism or Calvinism, then that's a big issue. Now, the problem that I found in, in coming to that chapter to write it is, okay, I understood the arguments of the Calvinist that said, you know, that there is compatibilism, the soft determinism, that God divine, divinely determines what's going to take place, but he uses the free will creature and he, 
make he doesn't do anything against their will but he makes sure that their will is in line with what he wants to happen and wants to take place so i could understood this to understand this plus i could go to scripture and depending on how i viewed the passages that were used i could see how they could argue for that but the other point was is i could go to the scripture and i could see look at all the passages and i could also argue for open theism but even worse i could go to the scripture and i could argue from a, a you know a kind of a uh, an Arminian perspective that God just knows the future. He knows what people are going to choose in the future, uh, even though they have free will choice and he doesn't determine it, but he knows what the, they're, they're going to do exactly. And so I could argue that also from the scripture. And so I was at a kind of at a, a crossroads of trying to figure out, well, what do I do? I can't just write a chapter in a book because I just can't choose one. I can't just say, well, I prefer this one, you know, and when the scripture from the scripture, I could argue either way. So I had to make a decision. And so at that point, I, I stopped writing the book because I was like, well, I, I can't write a chapter just based on my own uh, presumptions or my own you know, inclinations. I need to know what the word of God is teaching. And I could not discern it. I could kind of in my heart say like, yeah, well, I believe it's this way because of God's character and all those things. I could make a decision, but I couldn't have anything that would give me a solid a solid ability to be able to know for sure that that's what the scripture was teaching, at least not enough to be able to teach it to others and count it as true. So I, in that season, God, you know, as I stopped writing the book, <clears throat> God just, uh, I don't even remember exactly how, I was just looking for, you know, what the answer to that was. And I ended up reading some books and got into the place where I was reading about the early church. And as I was reading the early church, <clears throat> and I was reading about the early church and, and their writings, I came to understand like, oh, it's important for me to understand what they said. And if they agreed on something, then I should just submit to that in general, you know, unless the, something in the scripture is very clearly against what they're teaching, then I should at least welcome their paradigm. I should welcome their understanding of the Christian faith because they're the ones that were dying for it. They're the ones that were going to the lions for it. So I should be, you know, at least take seriously what they were writing, even though the early church writings are much different than what I was used to in, you know, kind of Protestant thinking and, and uh, uh, you know, kind of reformed ideas, you know, it, they, they word things differently, they speak in a different way, they're coming from a whole different perspective. And so I thought I need to take this very seriously. And of course, as I went into it, then I found that, okay, on the question that I was asking about the foreknowledge of God, they were utterly clear. Uh, there was a complete consensus that human beings were genuinely free, that they had a, a, a freedom to choose A and B, as it would, they'd say in the kind of the more philosophical debates, that it was a libertarian free will, that man was genuinely free to choose A or B, that it wasn't something that God ordained what they were going to choose by choosing what they were going to will and all that kind of stuff. It was very clear that they were, had freedom of will, and it was very clear that God knew the future totally. He wasn't just kind of generally knowing what was going to happen. He knew the exact details of what every person was ever going to choose. And so this was a big argument that they had. You know, those in the early church were often fighting with the, the Gnostics and arguing with those, uh, the, the Greeks that had Stoicism and that had this kind of fatalistic and deterministic mindset. And so they argued that if a man doesn't have free will to choose good or evil, then that means that he is... Uh, not accountable for what he does. And so the judgment and the justice of God stands on it. So it sounds like a very Arminian argument, but it wasn't Arminian, it was orthodoxy. The orthodox view was that man was free and that God perfectly knows the future. So open theism was out for me. And Calvinism, you know, was, was never really an option for me because I, I, I didn't think that it was true according to the character of God, but the early church helped me to clarify that and say, no, what I'm, what I'm believing here is not just my own opinion or my own perspective, but it's orthodoxy. It's the standard. It's historic Christianity. And so that was kind of how I came to this. But let's go ahead and run into or look at what the logic of it is. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1. So you, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Share the things that you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses with faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So this is something very important when we consider the early church. And by the early church, I'm meaning until about 300 AD, you know, up to the time of the Council of Nicaea when Constantine got involved. And uh, with all that, everything kind of shifted. It became more of a state church. They began to persecute 
unbelievers. They begin to persecute uh, heretics like Arius and anybody that they counted as a heretic, they would begin to use the power of the sword to be able to persecute. Before this, the early Christians were dying, being slaughtered. And so when I say pre-Nicene Council, uh, the early church believed in the Trinity. They taught the Trinity. The, sometimes the way they worded it would not be so, you know, fit with the Nicene Creed or whatever, but they definitely believed that Jesus was God, that he was pre-existent with the Father, that there was, there was three in one. And so they believed that, they taught that, but the way that they lived was different than right before the Council of Nicaea. So when we read this passage, Paul is telling Timothy that what you've heard from me I want you to pass it on to faithful men and from them that they, so that they can teach it to other faithful men as well. In other words, the gospel and the teaching of Christianity is not all about this kind of theology, this high-minded theology where we're trying to figure out all the secrets of the universe, try to figure out what every mystery is in the scripture. No, the faith that was once for all handed down to the saints, as it says in Jude, the saint was, it was passed on to the first generation of believers, and then their, their goal was not to then develop it, not to kind of develop things theologically and get better understanding of this and better understanding that. Instead, they were supposed to hold on to what they received and keep it faithfully. So this is a lot different than the way people do theology now. They're kind of like experimenting. They're thinking, oh, maybe the answer to this strange question is, is with this. And if I tie this verse with this verse, then I can make it. And they're kind of building stuff up. A good example of, the, of this is if you look at the Westminster Confession of Faith. In the early church, they had what was called the Roman Creed or also known as the Apostles' Creed. And it would just went basically, you know, uh, you know, we believe in, I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, and and so on. And so, you know, it's probably, I don't know, a hundred to two hundred words long. But when you go to the Westminster Catechism or you go to the Westminster Confession of Faith, I think it gets up to like sixteen thousand words because what they're saying is, here's what we need to believe, and they answer all these. The, uh, theological and philosophical questions in such detail. And you think, well, how can they answer all these things? Yes, they use verses for them, but they're building this whole system. And so there's this big, complicated theological system. If you look at Calvin's uh, Institutes of the Christian Religion, you know, he wrote when he was 27 as a lawyer, and it's this big book and maybe a series of books. It's, it's huge. And it's supposed to answer and tell us what, the, what Christianity is. But in the early church, Christianity was made up of that simple creed. Let me go ahead and read that real quick. So the Apostles' Creed, in other words, the creed that the early church held to, this was the Christian faith for them. This is what they believed. I believe in God, the Father, Almighty, Maker, uh, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. So already we see, I believe in God, the Father. I believe in Jesus Christ, His Son, our Lord. And later it's going to say in, in the Holy Spirit. So it's Trinitarian. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended to heaven, is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. So this section of the creed is very interesting because it's just a summary of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So... The creed was the gospel, and the gospel was the creed. The message of Jesus, his kingdom, of salvation through him, of the judgment that's to come, all these things were the message of the scripture. This is why this channel is called Kingdom Theology, is because everything always goes back to Jesus Christ, his kingdom, and the grace that he brings through his death, burial, and resurrection, how he became king through the death, burial, and resurrection. And so we see that all these things lead back to us serving Jesus Christ our Lord, trusting in him and rejoicing in him. So this is the creed. It goes on, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, meaning the universal church that all believers everywhere are part of that church, the communion of saints, that's a fellowship of believers, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And so we see the basics of the Christian faith are summarized here in this short, short creed, in this short uh, message. But later generations, they became more complicated in what they said because they got involved in systematic theology to, degree, to a degree that was kind of inventive, creative, trying to discover all the mysteries. But here, Paul is saying that he's saying that, look, what you've received from me, don't add to it, don't develop it, don't let it evolve. 
Instead, hold on to it and give it, as I've given it to you, to faithful men who will then be able to teach other faithful men. So when you read the early church writings, what you'll notice is that they were just trying to stick to what they, they were taught. They weren't trying to develop things. Now, eventually some men did, men like Origen, they would start developing other ideas. They'd start questioning certain things. Uh, that would be like around... Uh, in the 200 ADs, 200 AD, somewhere around there. So Origen would write something like that, maybe 260 AD, not quite sure. But even then, uh, one of the best summaries of what the early ch church taught was in the preface that he had to his uh, principles. He had a book called Principles or the, the Beginning Principles or something like that. But in his preface, he went ahead and said this. He said, look, the church has always taught the same thing, and he listed some things and kind of went through. He kind of went through the Apostles' Creed, but in more detail. And he talked about free will. He talked about the fact that we don't obey Sabbath. We don't, you know, we're not Judaizers. He talked about all those things. Those were the the universal teaching of the church in the early years. But then he says, but now in this book, I'm going to develop some things and I'm going to search into some mysteries, but these are just my ideas. And so he's kind of the one that started this idea of, of theology in a sense, instead of just basic doctrine and sticking to the faith. I, I reference to Jude. Let's go ahead and turn there. Jude. There's only one chapter, verse, let's see, verse 3. Beloved, while I diligently tried to write to you of the salvation we have in common, I found it necessary to write and appeal to you to contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. So the faith that was handed down, uh, that was just summarized in the Apostles' Creed, was handed down to the believers. In fact, the scripture was given to us by the early church whenever they started to see that there was a lot of different sects rising up, a lot of different... Uh, heresies were kind of coming in and saying that they were teaching the teachings of the apostles and they were lying, especially Gnosticism. And so the early church said, wait a second, all the apostles are dead and even those that know them are dying off. We better gather together the New Testament writings and we better close the canon. We better say, this is the standard from now on. You can't add to this. You can't take away from this. This is the standard. So the early church gave us this canon so that we wouldn't drift away from the apostolic teaching. And so when we come to the scriptures, we have the apostolic you know, what is orthodoxy? Orthodoxy or, you know, historic Christianity is going back and we come to the scriptures and with the scriptures, we look at the scriptures, we understand the scriptures in the context, and we we make sure that we're, we're understanding the scriptures properly. But whenever somebody brings something that we're thinking and they kind of bring a new paradigm, a new way of thinking about something, and they bring it in and we say like, oh, I've never considered it that way. Uh, example, Hebraic roots, you know, in... In the Bible, if we come to the New Testament, we read it, we realize, oh, Jesus is the fulfillment of everything in the Old Testament. It's just very clear. It's very obvious. Even those that are in the Hebraic Roots movement, unless they grew up in that movement, they all believe Jesus was the fulfillment of all things. We need to follow after him. The Old Testament is a little bit confusing. It's got this kind of you know, law and stuff that we don't have to do anymore. But then somebody comes along and says, no, no, no. The Old Testament is the beginning of the book. We need to build on the foundation. And it was the Hebrew mindset that we need to go from, not from the, the Christian or the New Testament mindset. We need to start with the Old Testament and view the New Testament through the Old Testament. So they'll switch everything around. Then somebody will come to Scripture and they'll be like, well, Paul was a Jew. He did preach every Sabbath in the synagogue. So that's kind of like he's obeying the Sabbath. And Jesus always went to the synagogue, so maybe I should obey Sabbath because after all, it says we should walk as Jesus walked. So he walked as a Jew. He went to Sabbath, you know, not to mention he wore sandals and so we should wear sandals, but that's beside the point. But so the mindset will come in. They'll bring in this unorthodox idea and then it, it changes our paradigm about how we view the scripture. And then that becomes dangerous because then we have to go through and reinterpret all the scripture, which is something like a Hebraic roots movement will do. They'll go through all the passages that were already very clear and they'll reinterpret it. But what we should do is whenever that new idea, that new paradigm comes, we should say, wait a second, is that what orthodoxy taught? Was that what, is that what was handed down to the saints once for all? Is that what faithful men taught other faithful men who taught other faithful men for, for centuries and that they agreed upon? Or is this something new that is novel, that is something heretical and off? And whenever we find out it's off his, orth, from orthodoxy, we don't have to consider it. We don't have to say, okay, well then maybe, it, maybe I should just test it with the scripture and if it makes sense, then I'm going to follow that. No, 
Orthodoxy can protect us from that. We already have the scriptures, we understand the scripture, and orthodoxy, the paradigm of orthodoxy, will help make sure that we don't get off uh, looking into things that we shouldn't look into, okay? Now, I wanna use some examples of this. Um, oh, now, one other thing is, is when we think about the early church, most of the early writers are gonna be Greek writers. So, when they were writing, and they were interpreting scriptures, or they were referring back or quoting scriptures, they knew the language. They, weren't, they didn't just study it and, and learn Greek in seminary. That was their language, and it was a very similar culture because they were in that era. They were living near that time in the you know, 100 AD and 200 AD. That was still a similar era in history. And so they had a closeness to the apostles and the apostles' teaching, and many of them knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody, uh, one of the apostles. And so there was a closeness there was a context that was closer than us. So a lot of times it is, is somewhat arrogant for us to imagine that 2,000 years later, because we go to a Baptist church, we're able to understand the Bible better than Justin Martyr, who gave his life for the gospel, who grew up speaking Greek and who you know, was only you know, uh, 100 years removed from the apostles that we know better than he does. And so it's often we need to be, have a submissive heart we need to have a humble heart when we deal with the writings of the early church. And again, I'm not saying that everything that they said was right, and we need to know how to kind of filter through some things, and we'll get to that later in this video. But just in general, we need to have a humble heart that, wait a second, there are brothers in Christ. They gave their life for the gospel. They went to the lion's den. Literally, they went and, and fought with lions in the arena for the gospel's sake, for the name of Jesus Christ. So we shouldn't write them off as, oh, these primitive natives. They, they don't have 2,000 years of church history where we've been building this great and grand theology. No, they had the simple gospel of Jesus Christ, and we've been building on it, and we better be careful how how we have been building on it. So I hope that that is clear. But let's look at some examples. Okay, let's go to Colossians. Um, so I can get to the New Testament here. Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Okay, Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Okay, now we're going to read passages, and what I want us to note is as we read them, they're very clear. They're something, if we come to the Scripture, we already knew this. This was something we kind of already knew. Um you know, uh, and, but then it can get twisted. Okay, verse 16. Therefore, let no one judge you regarding food or drink or in respect of the holy day or new moon or Sabbath days. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So somebody that's been born again, they come to this and they read this and they're like, yeah, okay, Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. All those things in the Old Testament were just shadows. They were just types. The Sabbath, Jesus says, come to me, all who are weak and heavy laden. He is our Sabbath rest. Jesus is the point. All those things were just pictures pointing us to Jesus Christ because Jesus said, you know, the scriptures just point to him. And so it's very easy for us to understand this. But whenever these false theologies come in, these, you know, usurpers basically, these strongholds come in, and they bring in these ideas and they say, no, no, look at it in a different way. If you look at it in a different way, you'll see that it means something different. And so, for example, this one, those in the Hebraic Roots movement will say, no, no, you've got it all wrong. What he's saying here, what Paul is saying, is that let no one judge you regarding food or drink or in respect to holy days or new moons or Sabbath. He's saying, look, as Christians, we obey the new moons, the 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 new moons, the Sabbaths, we obey the food laws, the dietary laws, because that's what we do as Christians. Don't let anybody judge you for doing that. Don't let anybody tell you, no, you can't keep the Sabbath. No, you can't do these things. And so they will twitch, twist it on its head. But when you read it, when you just read what it says, therefore, let no one judge you regarding food or drink or respect of a holy day or a new moon or Sabbath days. It can mean what they said. It's not illogical their interpretation. The interpretation that that's saying it's defending people who keep the Sabbath days instead of defending people who don't keep the Sabbath days, that it's a logical interpretation. And so this is the danger of heretical movements is a lot of times they can come and focus on one issue and in that issue, they can find a lot of verses. And once you switch your mind about how that verse should be interpreted, what perspective you should come at it, what paradigm you use to read it, then it flips everything and you're like, well, that makes sense. 
It does say, don't let them judge you according to these things. And I'm doing these things. And now all my Christian friends are telling me, no, you need to go to, you need to not keep Passover. Instead, you need to, you know, celebrate Easter. You know, you don't need to uh, do the new moon festivals. Instead, you need to practice Christmas. And so somebody that starts accepting that will say, yes, this makes sense. So Paul here is encouraging me, don't let these Christians discourage me from keeping the Old Testament laws. And so we see that that is easy to switch the meaning of a scripture and it still be logical. This is where orthodoxy comes in because we say, wait a second, is that what the early church believed? Did the early church in have a consensus that they were saying like, yeah, it, you know, we should keep some of the Old Testament laws? No, when we go back to orthodox, we go back to the first 300 years of the writings of the early church, then what we'll find is that no, universally they were saying, no, we are not to go back under the old covenant laws. We are not to keep them. This is why those in the Hebraic Roots movement will say, ah, they were off. They were against and they will make up some, you know, conspiracy theory that they were just trying to switch things and change around. And Constantine came along and he changed the worship from Saturday to Sunday. And they'll make all these conspiracies, which will then enforce the idea and the heresy that we come to the scripture and look and read this verse and say, oh, yeah, see, I can keep the Sabbaths and all these Christian people who are telling me not to do it. They are wrong. And so we see that the paradigm of the early church helps us. Let's look at another example. If we go to Hebrews Chapter 3, start verse 6. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of our hope firm to the end. So this seems to be saying very clearly, and if we come to it from a Christian perspective, we, we're, we're born again and we come to this to say, okay, we're part of God's house. And if we hold fast our confidence, if we keep trusting in Jesus Christ, rejoicing to the end, then we will uh, really be counted as God's family. It says the same thing in verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence firmly to the end. So as long as I keep walking with Jesus Christ, I will be a partaker of Christ. Okay, that's all very clear. That's all very orthodox. It's all very Christian. That we must endure in faith. That we must endure to the end to be saved. But then... The doctrines of Augustine, or actually Augustine didn't believe this, but the doctrines of Calvin uh, in the 16th century will come and say, no, no, there's a doctrine called the perseverance of the saints. The perseverance of the saints says that if you were unconditionally elected by God, you were chosen by him and he drew you to Jesus Christ and you were born again, you are definitely going to go to heaven no matter what. Now it's true, you must live in holiness, you must uh, continue to walk in holiness all the way to the end, you must endure to the end to be saved. But God will cause you to persevere. The perseverance of the saints, he will supernaturally guide you and make sure that you endure to the end. There is no way that you can turn away if you are a true believer. And that's what this verse is saying, they will say. They'll say, but if Christ is fa faithful over God's house as a son, whose house we are, we're presently his house, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of our hope firm to the end. So at the end, if we held our confidence firm to the end, then that means we were really saved. If we don't hold our confidence firm to the end, that means we were never truly part of his house. As it says in verse 14, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence firmly to the end. So if I endure to the end, that will prove that I was always a partaker of Christ. Okay, if I turn away, if somebody is walking with Christ and they turn away, they were never part of Christ. They were never part of God's household because God would cause them to endure to the end. And when we read it that way, for we have become partakers of Christ. Right now, we're partakers of Christ. If we hold our beginning firm, confidence firmly to the end, and if we don't, that means we were never partakers of Christ. That also makes sense. But if we go back to the early church, if we go back to the writings of orthodoxy, and the, the teachings of historical Christianity, is that how they viewed Christianity? That somebody that's born again is going to stay born again all the way to the end and they're going to endure in holiness no matter what? Or is this like orthodoxy teaches? This is a, a warning that we become partakers of Christ if we enter the end, we shall be saved. But if we turn back, even though we were walking with him at one point, even though we were in the kingdom at one point, we turn back, then we will not be fit for the kingdom of God. So in the early church, the universal teaching beyond all doubt is that, is that people can turn away from the faith. They can make shipwreck of the faith. They were true believers. They were born again. They turn away from God and then God rejects them because he denies those who deny 
him and he's not pleased with those that shrink back in faith. And so often, again, those in uh, that are at least educated in the early church writings, uh, you know, um, among Calvinists will say, yeah, the early church quickly went off. They w quickly went off from Augustine's faith. They quickly went off from, you know, Calvin's faith, you know, and, but when, it, but now we have Augustine, we have Calvin and they point us back to Paul and through, through them, we can understand what Paul really meant. So the early church didn't understand Paul's writings, but we do. And so again, they have to throw out orthodoxy and historical Christianity to be able to hold to their new doctrine. Now, as I use these examples, there is certainly different levels of, of heretical teaching. You know, this idea of determinism, of eternal security, uh, you know, that, that is held by those in the Calvinist camp is heretical. Heretical in the sense that it's novel, it's new. You know, Perseverance of the Saints was not even created with Augustine. It was created with John Calvin in the 16th century. It's brand new. It's not historical Christianity. It's not orthodox. But when we say that, it's not an, an emotional appeal. It's not a blame game of like, oh, see, now you're a heretic. You're out of the kingdom. All these Calvinists are not believers. And George Whitfield and, you know, Charles Spurgeon, what wicked men. No, not saying like that at all. Because their ideas are unorthodox, but they walked with the Lord. We're saved by Jesus Christ. We're not saved by holding all the right ideas in our mind. The danger of heretical teaching is whenever it leads us astray. If somebody believes this to a degree that, oh, I'm being tempted by sin right now, but it's okay, I'm one of God's elect, and so even if I fall into sin, I'm not too afraid of it because God will bring me back, and they fall into sin, they stay in sin, and they go to hell. That's a danger, and so there's a danger to that, but as long as people don't go to those routes, as long as they don't believe those things and go to those extremes, then that means they're not walking away from Christ. Uh, you know, somebody in the Hebraic Roots movement might say, yeah, I feel in my heart I need to keep the Sabbath, I need to to do these things, but I don't cut myself off from other believers. I believe that they are also saved because they trust in Jesus Christ. So that person is trusting in Jesus for salvation, not trusting in the law for salvation. But somebody says, no, if you reject the law of Moses, you're rejecting Christ and you're not loving him and you're not trusting him. They're trusting in the law, not trusting in Jesus Christ. And it's only through Jesus Christ that we can be saved. So it's not the ideas. It's not just having the wrong concept in our brain because we've all at this moment got wrong concepts, but we're trusting to Jesus. That is the key. Let's go to another. Looking at examples of trying to understand why uh, or how it is helpful that we have these understandings of orthodoxy. In Matthew chapter 25, Matthew 25, this is going to be the parable. Jesus gives the parable about the sheep and the goats, those that, you know, fed the sick and, and the hungry and those that walked in obedience to, to Christ's law to love others and then those that didn't. So the sheep and the goats, they're divided. But at the end, in verse 46, it says this, and they will go into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So we'll hear that and we'll say, okay, eternal punishment. Okay, so that means that they're going to be punished forever. They're going to be suffering God's punishment forever, but the righteous into eternal life. They're going to be receiving life from God forever. And so this is a very clear teaching. Uh, you know, somebody is forever going to suffer punishment. Somebody forever is going to receive life. And that's a very orthodox and clear teaching. And then somebody comes with an idea and says this, oh, actually in the Bible, when somebody dies, it talks about them perishing. In other words, them disappearing, them no longer existing, them dying. Dying means they die and they no longer exist. And so here, when Jesus is saying that the righteous will, that, and they will go away into eternal punishment, it means the punishment is death and non-existence. And so when somebody dies, they're no longer going to exist and they're not going to exist forever. It's going to be forever that they don't exist. So it's an eternal punishment. The punishment is to die and stop existing. And that punishment is going to last forever because they're never going to exist again. And eternal life just means that when they die, they're going to be raised from the dead and they're going to have life everlasting. And so when somebody comes with that, which is annihilationism, they come with this idea that people aren't going to suffer eternity uh, under the wrath of God uh, in hell, but instead hell is going to be of limited duration or immediately once they die, they're going to stop existing or after a short time in hell, they're going to stop existing and hell's going to stop existing. All these ideas, then they will come and they'll tell you this idea. They'll bring in this philosophy, this interpretation, this paradigm, this perspective. And when we come to the passage and read it, there's nothing illogical about what they say. And they will go away into eternal, something that's going to last forever, punishment, 
non-existent. So their non-existence is, gonna is their punishment and it's going to last forever. But the righteous into eternal, it's going to last forever. Life, they're always going to exist. They're not going to die eternally. They're not going to non be non-existent eternally. So we see, okay, that makes sense. And we start to accept this heretical idea. And why do we call it heretical? Not because oh, pointing our fingers, you're her heretical, you're going to hell. We call it heretical because it's unorthodox, because it's not according to historical Christianity, because it's not according to the faith that was once for all handed down to the saints, the consensus of the early church. And so when we come to it, we don't have to consider it. You know, we might listen to some de debates on it. We might try to understand the perspective where people are coming from with this. But ultimately, whenever we come down to it, we're going to say, but I'm not going to consider following it because it's completely unorthodox. If I go to the scriptures in the, the Bible, the New Testament particularly, but there's also passages in the Old Testament, I would come to it and I would understand from the scriptures and I could defend from the scriptures that the, the punishment of hell is going to be eternal conscience, conscious torment from God, the wrath of God poured out on people. Okay, I can clearly, can, can clearly uh, prove that from the scriptures. But I could also, I understand the perspective enough to be able to go and also prove from the scripture, just the words that are used in scripture, I could prove or at least give a strong argument that no, what it means is that we're going to die and be non-existent forever. And that's what hell is, that we're just going to stop existing and we're going to go in the fire and we're going to dissolve. So the fire will last forever, but we will, we will no longer exist. So from the words of scripture, somebody could cause that to convince somebody that that is what the scripture is teaching. But first they have to give them a paradigm and a perspective that's unorthodox. But if we, when that comes, if this unorthodox perspective comes, you know, then we need to say, wait a second, why would I consider that? Why would I change my perspective? You know, what are my motives for wanting to receive this new idea, this novel doctrine? Why would I receive this instead of submitting to the faith that was very clear in the early church and the way that the early church looked at the scriptures because the scriptures were given to us by the early church. And so why would I just abandon them and say they didn't know what they were talking about and, and go with something else? So there's no reason to do that. So that's where orthodoxy helps us. That's the benefit. Let's go to another in, in uh, 2 Timothy. This is a, a very interesting one in 2 Timothy. <clears throat> If we read starting in verse 11, this is a faithful saying, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. This is a faithful saying, if we die with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Now this is, uh, so this is very clear. So, you know, if we deny him, he will deny us. If we're faithless, he remains faithful to himself. He will not deny himself so that he can remain faithful to us. He's going to not deny himself. If we do, we deny him, then we're going to be set apart. It's very clear. This is a, a teaching of scripture that tells us if we turn away from the Lord, if we don't endure to the end, we shall not be saved. It's, it's, it's very, very clear until somebody in the so-called free grace movement come and say, comes and says, look, if we're faithless, he remains faithful. Okay. He remains faithful to us because, you know, uh, you know, because he's just faithful, even though we're faithless. Because, yeah, we're all faithless. We're all sinners. We're all, you know, it, it doesn't depend on us. It's, it's not by works. It's by grace. It's not by us continuing in faith. That would just be another work. No, no, no. It's just a, so they'll say that and we'll say, but wait a second. We see in the passage, it says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. It's not talking about him being faithful to us. It's talking about him being faithful to himself. And so then maybe they will say, okay, okay, let me go back and think this through. And so the best one that I've heard is from those that kind of, they mix free grace with dispensationalism. And so I heard one guy answer this and he said this. He said, say, it's very clear. If we die with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure with him, we shall also reign with him. So it's talking about the kingdom, the millennial kingdom, reigning with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. That means if we deny him, we're not going to be reigning with him in the millennial kingdom. Yes, we'll go to heaven, but we're not going to be reigning with him in the millennial kingdom. 
If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So we're not going to get rewards in the millennial kingdom. We're not going to be ruling and reigning with him. Yes, we're going to heaven because it's by grace through faith and it's not of works. As long as you believed one time, you're safe forever, no matter what happens. Complete eternal security, even if you become unbelieving, if you deny Jesus Christ, no matter what you do, you become a Judas. As long as you really believed at one time, you are going to heaven, but you won't reign with him in his millennial kingdom. And so they'll mix it in. And then when you go back to it, and if you accept all that, if you accept this idea of different judgments for going into the kingdom, different judgments for eternal life. If you accept all this, uh, this unorthodox teaching, and then you come back and you read, if we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Yeah, so we won't, we won't rule with him in the kingdom. It makes sense. It's logical. So just because we can make it logical doesn't mean that's what was meant when it was written. Just because we can we can twist the, the perspective that we come at the scriptures with doesn't mean that that's solid. So how, what is a way that we can know that we're coming to the scriptures rightly? Well, scripturally speaking, first of all, we need to have the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God leads us into all truth. But also we need to come like looking at and trying to understand what's the, what is the teaching of the context what is the passage saying? What is you know the author saying? What is some of the other things the author said elsewhere? What's the New Testament as a whole saying? What's the Old Testament and New Testament saying? And we get a big picture. That's how we come to understand the scripture. But even when we do that, then still somebody could bring us back. But yes, this verse, couldn't it also mean that we're not going to enter the kingdom? If we just take this verse alone, couldn't it mean that? Well, yes, it could, unless we go back to orthodoxy and we understand no. Orthodoxy would forbid that understanding. They would, uh, when we go to, when we go back to orthodoxy, we understand that no men could fall away from the faith and they would be punished, even though they were once a believer. They were going to be punished in eternal hell and separated from God. Not just cast out of a millennial kingdom. They're going to be cast out away from God's presence. God's going to say, "I never knew you." He's going to completely disown them, cast them away forever. And so we understand from orthodoxy, oh. Yeah, their interpretation makes sense if you believe all their presuppositions and all their ideas, but it's not orthodox. It's not historic Christianity. And so that can guard us and keep us from falling into these errors like the so-called free grace movement. Let's go to another in uh, Revelation chapter 21. I hope we're getting some concept to understand that it's, it's not just us coming to a verse and making sure it makes sense. There's more to it, even if we come to the verse and it seems to fit with the entirety of Scripture, because these systems, things like Hebraic roots, um, you know, Calvinism to a lesser degree, I don't put Calvinism in the same, you know, error category as Hebraic roots or free grace. It's definitely in that same category with Hebraic roots. Those two, the two most dangerous, uh, you know, heresies or dangerous uh, systems in our day are going to be Hebraic roots and the so-called free grace movement. But again. People can be in those movements and not take them to the extremes and not perish just because they have the wrong concept or something. But my point was, what was my point? Uh, oh, my point was is that people can come and they can they can reinterpret a scripture, but they can also reinterpret the whole of scripture. If you go to look into the Hebraic Roots movement, you'll find out that they've got a whole system. There's going to be very few passages that you're going to come to that they haven't thought through and reworked to be able to get it to fit in with their, their paradigm and their unorthodox perspective. Let's go to Revelation chapter 22. Let's see here. Uh, at verse 17. The spirit and the bride say, come, let him who hears say, come, let him who is thirsty come, let him who desires take the water of life freely. So here the Bible is clearly saying that everyone is truly invited and anybody who desires to drink of the water of life can freely come and take it. In other words, salvation is for everyone. Jesus died for everyone. Salvation has been prepared for everyone. They're all invited to the wedding feast. It depends on their choice. Do they want to come or do they not want to come? Do they respond to the gospel message or do they reject the gospel message? They can all come. This, this is the, the plain teaching of this verse. Or we could put a deterministic, Calvinistic tulip spin on it and say, yes, this verse is true. The spirit and the bride say, come. That's why we go out and proclaim the gospel. Let him who hears say, come. If somebody believes the gospel, let them also proclaim to others that they should come. Let him who is thirsty come. Everybody is truly invited. God goes out with the gospel and invites every single individual. Let him who desires take the water of life freely. And anybody who desires can come and take of it. But of course, the only ones that are going to desire it are those that God first regenerates 
by his his monergistic regeneration he causes them to be born again they will be changed into a new creature and then they will want to come and desire to come so before that the gospel will go out but people won't come they won't want to do it but whenever god changes their heart then they will want to come and then they can come so the invitation is for everybody but only those that god monergistically changes in their heart gives them a new spirit first then they will believe, they will repent, and they will come to Jesus Christ. So let's look at that verse. Is that logical? The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let him who hears say, Come. Let him who is thirsty come. Let him who desires take the water of life. There's nothing illogical in that interpretation. But it is a completely unhistorical and unorthodox way of coming to the passage. The orthodox way to come in the passage is that Jesus died for everybody and salvation is for everybody, but it's up to you whether you're going to repent or not whether you're going to turn or not. And you say, well, that's, that's works. No, that's works according to the Calvinistic system and the philosophy that's already been baked into the system. So that if you say that a man can choose to repent when he hears the gospel, then you say, oh, okay, then you're, you're Pelagius or something. No, we're orthodox. We're just following what it was taught in the scripture and then what the early church taught along with, what uh, agreed with and, and the perspective that they came from because the early church would never say something so... Uh, outlandish about this passage to turn it on his head the the passage is very clear what it's saying is is please come god is calling out to every man be reconciled to god uh, through jesus christ this is the call and the invitation of god okay so we i want to see that's the benefit of orthodoxy is that it'll keep us from even taking seriously we won't take uh, you know, many parts of Calvinism, you know, the, the unique parts that were created by John Calvinus and Calvin and some by Augustine, we won't take those things as, as valid because they're completely unorthodox. They weren't invented until some of them in the 5th fifth, fifth century with Augustine, the others in the 16th century, like Perseverance of the Saints with, with Calvin. And so we'll say, well, no, that's just not historic Christianity. But even more important, we'll take things like the Hebraic Roots Movement, we'll take things like Annihilationism, we'll take things like, um, you know, the so-called Free Grace Movement, and we'll say, wait, these doctrines that they're bringing in, these are novel and new doctrines. They're a totally new interpretation on the scripture, and it's a totally different paradigm, a totally different lens that they're looking through. So they're not just changing a few words here and there, they're giving us a whole paradigm shift so that when we come to the scripture, we see it as they want us to see it. That is very, very dangerous. And orthodoxy or historic Christianity, the consensus of the early church can help us in that. Now, let me, in closing, let me give a couple uh, things here. Okay, first, there's limitations to orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is not scripture. Uh, the early church writings are not scripture. They are not the standard, the, the canon, the standard for our, our, our life and teaching. And so we, we can't think, consider them that way. They were not always in agreement, and they were not always biblical. For example, the, the early writers, you know, the first, you know, maybe 100 years, they uh, seemed to point to, when they did mention baptism, they kind of made it clear that baptism was for believers. For example, Justin Martyr said that we were born the first time without choice uh, whenever we, were, we came from our mother's womb, but we were born the second time, born again uh, through uh, baptism, we were born again, and by doing that, we were, by choice, we were born again, okay? And so he'll emphasize that we converted to Christ, we became believers in Christ through uh, our own choice. Later, they'll start, like men like Tertullian will start saying, like, look, it's best, because there was already infant baptism going on, and so they'll, they'll say, okay, we need to be careful how we do this. Let's hold off as long as you can, at least two or three or four years, hold off on baptism until the, the baby can understand a little bit better, you know, so there was still this lingering mindset of, wait a second, I remember, like, the believer's baptism must have been a thing back a hundred years ago, but already it become habit that they were doing infant baptism. And then you get later into, you know, 300 AD, and basically universally they were all baptizing infants. And so in this matter, what, what do we do? We say, well, the majority of, of writers in those 300 years, the majority that spoke about it talked about infant baptism, so we should believe that. No, we go back to scripture and scripture has a plain testimony. The scripture is plainly against that and that everybody that's baptized is a believer. The, the, the requirements for being baptized, repentance and faith are, are focused on um, means that you have to repent, you have to believe. Now, in the Reformation, they made up all kinds of weird things, like when somebody baptizes you as a baby, you have faith, even you don't hear the word and understand it. They have all these ways of getting around it, but the scripture is plain that we don't baptize babies, but we baptize those that repent and believe, okay? Um, and then other things like in uh, that are even more clear from the beginning that they had a consensus. 
the consensus of the early church, of all that I have read when they mention it, they will always mention that somebody should wait to be baptized, at least in the Didache. A Didache was a kind of like a church manual, and it was given around 100 AD. Uh, so this was very close to the beginning. And in that, that manual, it said that somebody to be baptized, they must first fast for three days. They must fast for three days and before they get baptized. And then after fasting for three days, then they can be baptized. So they would say you have to wait at least three days. Now, it's important to note that that means the Didache was saying that it has to be somebody that is choosing to be baptized, not an infant. But the point is, is that they were saying to wait for three days. Later, it eventually became custom that they would wait like at least a year, sometimes two years, that they would be trained first. They would be given instruction, make sure that the person was really wanting to walk with Christ before they got baptized. And they would often only baptize people like on, you know, on Easter. And that just kind of became the ritual and the pattern. This is clearly unbiblical because every time in the book of Acts, when somebody believed, repented and believed, immediately they were baptized. Uh, the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16, when he heard the message, the word of the Lord, then he was baptized that night, him and his family. All the people that heard the word and believed it, they rejoiced and they were baptized. And so we see that it's not something that we put off until later. So baptism is not supposed to be put off until later, that's not, uh, we don't go to the early church and say, well, see, the early church agreed on that, and so we believe it. No, if it's unbiblical, if it's clearly against scripture, like the, the clear, clearly against the teaching of scripture, then we don't follow their perspective. They're not the scripture. They're not uh, without fault, okay? And the last thing I want to point and uh, touch on is the fact of the danger of orthodoxy. What I've seen uh, throughout the years as people get going towards, you know, that they start reading the early church writings and they start reading, then they start to think, okay, yeah, I need to go and submit to the orthodoxy. And they make the first error in that they say that whatever the early church says, then I'm going to go with that. But there becomes another error that kind of starts to creep in. There was, um, in the early church, one of the things that they greatly argued with were the Gnostics. The Gnostics were those that said that they had this special revelation uh, and teaching, they had a lot of theology within it that, that the flesh is bad and the spirit is good and all these kind of things. But basically what they said is what they were teaching in, you know, like 200 AD was the secret things that the apostles had taught their disciples. And there was these, they were, they were secret things that they didn't give to everybody. They didn't reveal it to everybody. They only revealed secret mysteries only to specific men. And so these men in the 200 AD or, you know, 180 AD, they would say, look, what we're teaching is the secret teaching of the apostles. So the argument for that, men like Irenaeus who fought diligently against the Gnostics in like 160 AD in his, uh, his long book against heresies, he wrote to them, or his argument against them was this, look, we can go back and we can list to you the names of the different bishops, for example, the bishops in Rome, the bishops in Antioch, in the different places, we can list to you who was a bishop in this and we can give you the list of people. And so all of those taught the same thing that we teach today. So what they were teaching, we are teaching. And they were laid hands on by the apostles. So the apostles taught them. So if the apostles were going to teach something, they would have taught them. And so what we know is in line with all the bishops and is in line with the teaching of all the bishops. Okay? So this was their argument. They were basically saying that our teaching goes all the way back to the beginning. But what happens is, where does Roman Catholicism and even Eastern Orthodoxy, where do they come from? They come from an argument like that. They come from an argument that says, look, as long as we have an organization and our organization can, can mark out all the people that go back to the beginning, then that means our organization is true. See, we can go from, you know, the present Pope and we can go to the other Bishop of Rome, Bishop of Rome, Bishop of Rome, all the way back to the first Bishop of Rome, all the way back to Peter, in Rome, we can go all the way back and we can trace our line. And since our organization has that direct line of organization, then we are the true church. That is not the argument the early church was making. The early church was making the argument that because it had only been 150 or 100 years, they knew the names of all the bishops and they knew what they taught and they were teaching the same thing. So the argument of Irenaeus was that we are teaching the same thing that has been taught from the apostles and the disciples of the apostles from the beginning. That's why we know what we're saying is true and yours is a new and novel doctrine. It's something brand new that you have invented and you are saying the apostles taught it, but they did not. We prove it because we go back to the apostles. So the argument is different, but a lot of times when people get involved in reading the early church, they start getting 
too committed to tradition. They start getting too committed to, uh, you know, uh, what the early church taught. Basically, they say, well, the early church is basically on par with the scriptures. And so since the early church had certain traditions and now, you know, the Catholic church has certain traditions, since they baptized babies and they believe that if somebody's baptized, then they're automatically born again and they're already automatically regenerated and become part of the kingdom of God. Well, since they teach that, then I need to become a Roman Catholic because they have the line of bishops. They teach the same thing about baptism as some of these men taught. And so I need to follow that. And so people will go astray from the scriptures because they'll put orthodoxy as, at too high of a place. Orthodoxy is meant only to be a helpful paradigm, something that can help guide us in matters that come up and we, we go back and we say, wait a second, is this really new or is this something that's been taught in the church in historical Christianity? And we can go back and we can say, wait, the consensus of the early church was completely against this idea and there's... In the scripture, we could go either way with it. And so I'm going to go with what the early church taught. I'm not going to go against that. And so we use it to help us. We don't use it as the foundation of our faith. The foundation of our faith is the scripture that was given to us by the early church and that cannot be added to nor taken away. It's the New Testament canon. And we go to that. That is the inspired word of God. But we, when we think of the disciples that received uh, the, the disciples of the apostles and their disciples and their disciples, when they all agreed on something and they had the same perspective on the New Testament teaching, then unless the New Testament is really against it, we should stick with what they say. And so I hope that's helpful that if you do start reading the early church that you don't flip out and jump into Eastern Orthodoxy or into uh, Roman Catholicism because those lead into idolatry and worshiping icons and praying to, to dead people, which is necromancy and all these kind of things. We, we don't want to go that route. And so we need to stick to the plain teaching of scripture. And this is where, you know, uh, if you've visited this channel very well, this is why I, uh, I'm in, you know, my, my, my ideas and my thoughts or my, my perspective is coming from an Anabaptist perspective. In the Reformation, there was the magisterial reformers, men like Luther and Calvin, that had all these high theologies. They had uh, mixed religion and politics. They persecuted their enemies through the power of the state. They did all these things. And then there were the Anabaptists, men who believed that, no, we need to uh, baptize those that repent and believe, and we need to not take the power of the sword. We need to not persecute our enemies. We just need to preach the word of God and we need to live in simplicity, in holiness and righteousness and a walk in faith in Jesus Christ, trusting him, not going after the idolatries of the Roman Catholics or after the, you know, the political ambitions and the, the high philosophies of the magisterial reformation, but we need to stick to the simple scriptures and a simple Christian life. And so that's where the perspective I'm coming from and that they line up very well with the early church teachings. And so uh, that's where I, I take my stand. So I, I don't, I hope this has been helpful to you uh, to be able to understand, you know, how we can use the historic Christianity to our benefit as we're kind of navigating through different uh, theological systems and different issues that come up from time to time and kind of the, the theological winds of our day. And so I hope this has been helpful to you. If it has been helpful, then go ahead and like and uh, share it to somebody else that might find it helpful that kind of help, helps the algorithm get going to kind of share it with more people and if you haven't subscribed and you're interested in more you know theology that's focused on discipleship it's it's it has the goal of leading people to uh, a trusting loving rejoicing obedient life with jesus christ and clinging to him and not to uh, a lot of high philosophies but to the simplicity of scripture and to walking with him if you're if you're interested in knowing that and you haven't subscribed go ahead and subscribe and uh, we have teachings at least three days a week at this point and sometimes more and so i hope you'll find it helpful okay god bless